this is going to be pretty stiff headwinds for many years to come. Dr. John Allen, uh, welcome to our conversation. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I want to begin uh, by asking uh, you, Dr. Allen, uh, on uh, what your role entails uh, in a large system uh, as uh, Michigan Medicine. Let me give a little background on my journey first. Um, I'm a trained gastroenterologist, obviously, and I think I've worked in almost every sit practice setting there is, from the VA to um, a hospital setting to a small practice to a mega practice, which was Minnesota Gastroenterology, and now two academic healthcare systems, first at Yale as clinical chief there, and now at Michigan, first as clinical chief of gastroenterology and now as chief clinical officer. And I also sit on the board of directors and chair the quality and population health committee for Alina Health, which is a large integrated healthcare system in Minnesota. I've gained a lot of perspective on academics, non-academics, and other aspects of GI practice, which has been really quite interesting. And so now I go back and forth between Michigan and Alina and can compare a non-academic consumer-oriented healthcare system with an academic system like Michigan. It's just, it's fascinating. What I actually do at Michigan, so I'm the chief clinical officer of the University of Michigan Medical Group. And so that entails all of the faculty and all of the professionals that basically bill. Um, all of those revenues come up through the UMMG, the medical group. We also manage the facilities for all ambulatory services. We have 40 different clinical sites. We have radiology, pathology, laboratory services, outpatient ORs. We have about 23 ambulatory ORs, uh, an equal number of ambulatory endoscopy centers. And all of those roll up to the executive leadership, which is um, the person I report to, Dr. Mahalan, who was the ex-chief of surgery, and he's the um, executive director. Then I'm the chief clinical officer, and I work directly with the chief operating officer and chief nursing officer. So we basically manage the operations of the ambulatory part of Michigan. What's interesting is that um, Michigan Medicine and Alina Health are about the same size, about $4.3, $4.4 billion in annual revenue. Um, and so, again, it's, it's really quite interesting to go back and forth between those two systems. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what does your role uh, look like? Is it more clinical or is it more on the business side of medicine? No, it's completely uh, administration now. I stopped uh, scoping uh, last September, a year ago, and have been staffing fellows clinics and things like that. But it's really completely administration. So I've, I've switched into the administrative role completely. Mm -hmm. And on a day-to-day -day basis, um, like, for example, this week, we're figuring out where, how often, and how to give flu vaccines to the 230,000 patients that are within our primary care catchment, um, and how to deliver those and safely within COVID and social distancing and things like that. So the operations of the clinics um, are our main focus. And I directly oversee 22 physician leaders, um, and then they oversee another probably 60 physician leaders paired with administrative and nursing leaders as well. So um, it's basically that type of day-to-day -day activity. Mm -hmm. uh, which world is uh, more fun, uh, the clinical side or the administrative side of um, medicine? They're both fun. Um, I practiced for 40 years, and at that point, I felt I had completed that phase of my life, and I was fine getting out of direct clinical care. Um, when I was 50, actually, I went back and got my MBA, got into the business side of medicine and health economics and payers and negotiation and organization, and, and I find that just fascinating. And in some ways, you can really make an impact on <clears throat> many people. Um, when, you're, when you're providing clinical care, it's really one-on-one, -on -one, whereas if you're really doing an administration coming from a patient-centric viewpoint, you can really make a difference in terms of 
how we deliver care in a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, was that transition easy for you, moving over uh, from the clinical side to the administrative side? Well, it was slow and iterative. It was not sudden. Um, I started out at Minnesota Gastroenterology in the mid-90s and got into a leadership position there in the late 90s and began to take on more of an administrative role. And it was a learning process. This is not easy, and it's not something you can learn from a book. It's, it's learning by experience and sitting through innumerable meetings and having to deal with all the different aspects of practice in different practice settings. So it's a slow process, but, you know, I'm now uh, towards the end of my career and, um, you know, I've gained a lot of knowledge there. And so it's a lot easier to make those kind of sy system connections. Um, and I, I, I find that very interesting. So it, it was a long process, uh, a long learning process, basically. Even though we are several months into COVID now, uh, you know, I want to revisit uh, the complexity of uh, handling uh, COVID, uh, you know, in a system like Michigan, uh, there were several months uh, that you sp spent in uh, handling it, doing different things as its leader. So I, you know, want to ask you, how was it? Uh, how, how did you go about, you and your team, how did you go about handling the situation, in, you know, in the health system? Well, I mean, frankly, it was brutal. Uh, it, it's brutal for the entire world. It's brutal for Americans, uh, and it's brutal for healthcare workers. As you know, January 20th was the first diagnosis of COVID in the United States in Seattle. In early March, basically, uh, we began to shut down elective procedures and shut down. And so we had to shut down an ambulatory operation that sees two and a half million people a year, visits a year, uh, within literally 72 to 96 hours. So we had to consolidate clinics. We had to figure out what patients could have deferred care, what patients needed to come in still for an emergency, how to handle them. Everybody was short of personal protective equipment. So it was a disaster, frankly, for a, a while. But the way we handled it in Michigan was very rapidly ramp up our infrastructure, which had been there before. So we have tiered huddles that start at the unit and go all the way up to the health system in the first two hours of every day. So we developed a command center that handled every aspect of the healthcare system, met twice a day with the topmost leaders and the frontline workers as well, and really managed it that way in terms of communication. We instantly converted many of the rooms in the hospital into a respiratory isolation uh, floor with negative pressure. We got, we got to the point where we could turn a, a hospital room into a negative pressure room in four hours. And we expanded in anticipation of hospitalizations, uh, intensive care units, ventilators, and ECMO. Um, so we had to create a um, admitting officer of the day that had complete control over transfers and admissions. He was a um, transplant surgeon who was just superb. We identified two ex-military physicians to develop plans for a field hospital. So we were ready to open up a 500 bed field hospital in the Michigan ten indoor tennis courts, basically. So we had all of these things and it really showed just the phenomenal preparation for unknown uh, that we had here. And I'm sure other systems had the same thing, but it was just incredible, the infrastructure that we could, and the expertise that we could rely on to ramp up that quickly. So we basically ramped down, and over the first three, three and a half months, we obviously closed down elective procedures and ended up going from a projected uh, operating margin of $175 million per year to a little bit over $300 million loss um, just in that period of time. Um, and interestingly, the ramping back up has been even more difficult um, with the unknowns that we're dealing with and with all the different clinical service lines that had to go from a consolidated delivery to a expanded delivery. So it's just been really challenging. Second or third week of the ramp down, uh, the regents of the university and the financial people at the university level 
basically mandated that we reduce costs on a long-term basis by $400 million, reflecting an anticipated $300 million loss plus the $100 million that we send to the medical school each year. We had to buffer that reduction in overhead, basically, which of course means personnel. So we had to go through a very complex system of reduction in force and ended up laying off over 500 people um, in selected areas, much less in direct patient care and more in support and administration. But that, that on top of the COVID itself and what we're having to do in terms of our own family was just emotionally brutal. A large system like Michigan uh, is like a mini country, wide variety of opinions, uh, a lot of diversity and many, many emotions that you have to navigate, not just yours or your immediate team, but, you know, of staff, uh, of patients uh, at, at different, different levels. How did you go about, you know, handling all that uh, as, as a leader? Well, as a leader, you don't do it by yourself, obviously. You have a lot of people around. And before um, 2019, we did not have the structured leadership um, in the infrastructure that we have now. Uh, it was very, very thin. And so Dr. Mahalan and I and our administrative and nursing partners have uh, basically hired an infrastructure for leadership, tiered leadership, over the last year and a half. And that had nothing to do with COVID, but had we not had that, it would have been a disaster. So from our standpoint as the top leadership, we have to convey a sense of calm and planning to that next layer of leadership and also teach them how to convey that to the next layer of leadership down and then the frontline staff. But the anxiety about you know, catching COVID, the anxiety about what to do with family, um, and now with schools being virtual and how do you handle home care um, has been very, very tough. But as a leader, you just, you have to not react. You have to not react from an emotional standpoint and, and really try to empathize and understand what other people are going through when you get those brutal emails in the middle of the night. And you basically have to learn to live with that, step back, take a couple of deep breaths, and then engage them as best you can. We've been going around to the departments and answering questions from faculty and then from staff that are, you know, really quite angry and, and upset. And there, sometimes there are no answers. I mean, we're having a terrible problem hiring at the medical assistant level or the call center level. Um, for a lot of different reasons. It's a you know, low paying job and it's very difficult to hire. So our call centers right now are really in difficult shape. Um, and we get emails daily about, you know, what are you doing about this? And you just really have to present the calmest face that you can and keep trying to think through this and anticipating, uh, anticipate what's needed. You know, at an individual level, uh what steps do you take on a daily basis or what your routine looks like that helps you uh, present yourself calmly uh, as a leader to your staff and patients and, and the wider community? Well, you have to realize that you're on 24-7. Um, you just cannot let down. So the first thing is um, those of us in administration or in non-clinical areas, the president of the university basically said, do not come on campus um, and don't come on campus until the end of the year. So I'm actually in Minnesota um, and I'm managing Michigan. Uh, Minnesota is my home. I've been commuting back and forth for many years, but you know, I came home to Minnesota and it's basically eight plus hours of Zoom conferencing and, and managing, but it's really a day-to-day -day interaction, making sure that you're touching base with the correct people, reassuring them that they have your back or you have their back and going on like that. So it's completely changed how we manage. They're, most of the top leaders that, again, don't have day-to-day -day <clears throat> staff interactions or face-to-face -face interactions are working remotely. And that's really changed things a lot. And 
we expect to continue that well into the first quarter of next year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For myself personally, um, daily exercise, making sure I get sleep, um, taking care of myself and family. My kids are grown, so it's my wife and I and our three dogs, but basically, you know, focusing on what we need as a foundation and then again, being able to project that to, to other people and trying to help them. Mm-hmm. This is a time when we have to come together and show our, mo- our most, you know, the most empathy we can and a giving spirit. And the more you can do that, really the better it feels internally. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I want to go back uh, to a point that you made earlier uh, about last week uh, or this week. Uh, you know, where you are uh, discussing internally about how do you administer uh, 200,000 plus uh, flu vaccines, uh, you know, across the board in the system. I'm interested to know what kind of tools do you use? How do you go about making these uh, decisions? How do you ensure, uh, you know, that it gets done? Uh, What kind of a rhythm or uh, project planning uh, do you have in place that uh, you see it rolls out in the coming weeks and months? have a really incredible um, chief operating officer and chief nursing op- officer. We have project managers assigned specifically to this. And flu is very interesting. We, ha- we, we manage the same problems every year. Uh, if you look at flu vaccination from a straight revenue standpoint, it's, it's really a money losing o- uh, operation. We get about $3 uh, in net revenue um, for administering a flu vaccine, but that doesn't really count all the back stuff that you have to do to prepare it. So it's really, you know, not something that you make revenue off of. However, it, it is an incredible emotional tie for primary care and their patients. They really want to provide this to their patients. So we have tried to say, um, you know, utilize Walgreens, CVS, and retail pharmacies to administer flu and have gotten pushback. They don't administer flu for kids under eight, for example. So our pediatricians absolutely insist on providing that. So then what you say is how do you do that and socially distance? You can't, you can't have a lot of people coming in for just flu shots to our big clinics because that literally takes the place of somebody that's coming in for you know, care of their diabetes or hypertension because of social distancing, because of PPE restrictions. So then we've popped up tents, which we of course did for COVID, but we're, you know, come November or October, that's not a viable option in Michigan. So we're now scrambling to find other areas uh, where we can administer uh, flu vaccines and testing um, in an indoor basis. And you'd be surprised at the pushback from a lot of landlords, they simply don't want that there. So it's been a real challenge. We have people scanning the facilities that are available in our county and state to try to identify this. But um, it's a process of identifying facilities, identifying staff, and identifying the cadence of bringing people in uh, in in the midst of COVID that uh, has been challenging, but um, really incredibly interesting. And we will succeed. That's the other thing we will make it happen. And, and I'm quite confident with that. In which wave of COVID are we in? You know, are we still in the first wave? Have we rolled into the second or, you know, is this, uh, is this an ongoing thing? Uh, how, the reason I'm asking is how do you account for it internally? You know, when you have internal planning meetings thing, are you expecting uh, things to return? Uh, and uh, I'm curious to know about your uh, planning process actually. Sure, yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, well, first of all, I, the wave that we're in now, whether it's the first or second wave or whatever, this is the chronic phase. This is the wave where we have to adapt our lives and adapt our care to existing with this monster virus for quite some time. Whether we get a vaccine in the next month or two, uh, there won't be mass vaccinations and there won't be enough immunity within the community to really dampen this down for a long time. I mean, we're really anticipating a year to 18 months. Um, that being said, when, when COVID first hit, um, nobody knew what to do. We didn't quite know what 
personal protective equipment we needed. We didn't have enough supplies. We didn't really know about the aerosol transmission and the importance of crowds and masking and all of that. So that initial wave hit us very hard. And a lot of times it hit vulnerable people like nursing homes or people in some sort of community living. Those are vulnerable people with multiple comorbidities and they got very, very sick. So they had to be hospitalized. They had to have ICU beds. They had to have ventilators. A few had to have ECMO and the death rate was just incredible. Now the increase in COVID is in people that don't necessarily need those, you know, end stage resources. It's more in young people who don't get quite as sick. Um, they obviously do get sick, but the demand on beds, ICUs, and ventilators is not as much. That being said, we've got a four tier program depending on um, the wave of COVID. You get about a two week notice when COVID infection starts and when the need for hospitalizations occur. So we are ready at a moment's notice to reconvert rooms that we sent back to general medicine and surgery. We have everything ready, depending on what COVID is in the community, we can predict incredibly accurately how many beds are needed, what ICU beds are needed, so we're ready for that. And it turns out that there's a big difference between summer and winter because negative pressure rooms require an incredible demand on your HVAC system. So in summer where you're running air conditioning and you add negative pressure rooms, um, you are limited with the number that you can do because of your HVAC requirements. In winter, that's a little bit different. So we actually have seasonally um, targeted plans for expansion to 15 beds, to 30 beds, to 60 beds. And of course, we always have the field hospital in our back pocket. I don't see that happening. And in fact, we're learning to live with this um, and we do not anticipate ramping down ambulatory care at all, no matter what happens in the community. And I think we'll see isolated hotspots that come up, you know, around parties or sororities or things like that. But I don't think we're gonna see the mass that we did uh, originally, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're not going to ramp down ambulatory short of an executive order from the government governor. In your internal discussions, are, are you planning for another pandemic? Uh, so, you know, not COVID, but in the future, uh, in case something else strikes? In some, it depends on the infection routes. For example, Ebola is quite different from an aerosolized route like influenza and COVID. Um, but we went through... Ebola planning, and we did all the things necessary in case Ebola hit. Um, we went through for uh, MERS and SARS and things like that. And obviously, we did this through COVID. We've documented everything. We have a very specific playbook um, that we could activate really on a dime. Mm -hmm. So whatever hits and whatever inf infection source, um, that pandemic uh, ha rests on, uh, we would be ready for it because we've done this kind of planning. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you've held and continue to hold leadership roles in societies and, uh, you know, which are at a national level. Uh, what kind of learning uh, can you take from, you know, what you already do at the large health systems and uh, enable that? And what kind of learning can be disseminated uh, to the smaller practices, uh, you know, that are spread across the country who may not have uh, the kind of resources that you may have at Michigan? It's a really interesting question, and it particularly hits gastroenterology. And some it relates to the history of gastroenterology. Traditionally, in the late 70s and early 80s, you had small practices or solo practices where a gastroenterologist would have a clinic um, and then go to the hospital to use their equipment to scope. So those practices had a very low fixed overhead, right? Their asset base that they needed to um, support was relatively small. In the mid early eighties, um, leaders like Gene Overholt and Cecil Challey and Mike Weinstein realized that we could develop ambulatory endoscopy centers then it became infusion centers and anesthesia and radiology. And 
we were able to do that to provide much better patient experience, much cheaper. But the downside of that is it put a tremendously high fixed cost within practices. I mean, obviously, you know this, you're a Ross School of Business graduate. So when you have those high fixed costs, it's like having a, a mortgage that, you know, where 80% of your home is mortgaged. If you have a downturning monthly cash flow, it can be annihilating. And that's what's happened during COVID. Practices depend on monthly cash flow from colonoscopy and seeing patients. And when that's cut off, you have to turn around and say, well, where's my capital coming from? And there are only a limited number of capital sources. You can borrow from the bank. You can connect with a health system that has deep pockets. You can connect with a private equity group, um, or you can connect with a strategic partner like Physicians Endoscopy, for example, or Optum. You need somebody that can carry cash year to year, which practices don't do because of tax consequences. So practices now are in a position where their cash flow is devastated and they need capital infusion. Um, and so we're seeing a tremendous shift in practices with consolidation, with sales to private equity, with sales to health systems, all, you know, all based on the fact that the monthly cash flow due to COVID has stopped and the fact that the median age of gastroenterologists, like a lot of other specialists, is pretty high. It's in the high 50s. So there are a lot of people that are approaching retirement and saying, I'm out, this is too much. So those things are gonna really change the face of GI coming up. And that's not even thinking about the economic impact on the United States. We're going to see Medicaid rolls go from about 70 million to over 80 million, which is going to stress state budgets like we have not seen ever. We're going to have a lot of people out of work. And of course, half the country gets insurance by, by their employer. So, and we're not going to, even if the economy recovers fairly well on a day-to-day -day basis or the equity markets recover, that infrastructure is going to drive patients into either government payers or being uninsured. And that for a health system or a practice is a real, real problem that we're not going to see resolution for two or three years. Mm -hmm. At Michigan, every switch from every 1% switch from commercial to government payers is $8 million dollars a less in revenue for doing the same service. So you multiply that times what's coming up in terms of the payer mix shift. Uh, that's going to be really difficult to handle, frankly. Yeah, it's going to be a very uh, complicated and uh, interesting problem uh, to so solve. Uh, you know, one thing that I wonder about, uh, you know, the big uh, entities and the small entities, not, not just uh, in medicine, but you know, we saw through COVID that large uh, companies, which we would have never thought, you know, would file for Chapter 11, uh, file like Hertz or, or JC Penney, or uh, uh, and, and uh, I think Neiman Marcus too. And and uh, there was an ophthalmology uh, private equity platform uh, that also filed for Chapter 11. So th there must be some. Uh, determining factor here that might drive though i agree with what you're saying like that uh, the smaller practices uh, the impact for them to handle the impact is more difficult uh, than for larger entities which may have uh, a cash position like you know they may have money in the bank more than smaller practices do uh, but i'm wondering uh, if uh, e you know even a large entity is safe uh, anymore. Uh, and I'm talking purely from an economic standpoint. I, I don't think it is without changing their business practice. Um, and I'm particularly worried about academic centers that have very, very high fixed overhead and are much less efficient than non-academic health systems, for example. It is very difficult um, to turn the ship in a big academic center like this. You know, typically health systems carry anywhere from 230 to 290 days cash on hand, that's their bank account, right? Well, that has really diminished. Um, if you look at the annual revenue for a, an organization like ours, it's about $11 million. So 
everyday cash on hand times $11 million is what we have in the piggy bank. And most of that is in liquid money. But a lot of the endowments, a lot of the uh, cash that we have is in illiquid funds or it's in dedicated funds for professorships or things like that. So again, from a cash flow problem, uh, it becomes really acute. So we've really had to scale back. Um, we've canceled planned facility expansion of two very big multi-specialty clinics. We've delayed um, a planned new hospital uh, build, and those all have ramifications. We have, you know, canceled the um, retirement match for all the clinical faculty, for example. Uh, we've each taken, the leadership has taken pay cuts, and I mean, those are temporary things to help in cash flow, but they're not sustainable. And I still don't think that we have fully appreciated the change in economics for the United States in healthcare because of things that I talked about a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be pretty stiff headwinds for many years to come. So that naturally takes us to my next question, which is on the future of uh, gastroenterology and healthcare in general, uh, actually. And I want to thank you first uh, for uh, giving a testimonial for my book, uh, Scope Forward, which is on the future of GI. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, what aspects of the book uh, resonated, you know, with you? Like, what do you think uh, is likely to happen and what didn't? Uh, and uh, in, in your own view, uh, what is the future of gastroenterology? So I appreciate um, both of your books, actually. And um, the Scope Forward book was very good. And the things that resonated with me is your continued warning about being dependent on a, a single service line, which is screening colonoscopy and surveillance colonoscopy. And, you know, we're seeing the results of that in COVID as well, right? You perceived very well the increased um, dependence on technology at many, many levels, whether it's remote patient monitoring, artificial intelligence and screening colonoscopy, um, all the different types of programs like sonar MD to monitor inflammatory bowel disease patients. There will be more and more of that. And we're going to separate, and I, and I think you were right on in that. And the danger of that is that those all cost practices. And the ability to handle what's gonna become routine gastroenterology or cardiology or neurology care, um, it's gonna be more and more expensive and regulations as well. Those expenses have reached a point in, in small practice or in medium-sized practices for sure that are really, really tough. If you're a very small practice in a rural community, for example, um, I actually think you're in pretty good shape because your overhead is low and you have a patient base that is dedicated to you and ability to, hand, to deliver really high quality GI care, I think will continue with that model. We're seeing consolidation and, and it's sort of that middle spot where you have a mid-sized practice that is gonna be really stressed to have the capital to handle these um, uh, innovations. And I think you hit that really well in your book. You also have um, a lot of emphasis on private equity, uh, both in your first book and, and some in this book as well. And I'd just like to speak a moment, if you wouldn't mind, about some of the yeah. risks that I see in private equity. The, the basic business model of private equity is to do a leveraged buyout where you basically accumulate whatever you're accumulating, whether it's a manufacturing plant or a practice, strip out costs as best you can, consolidate to achieve some sort of economies of scale, but you have to hit about a 20% annual return. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, if you're an investor in a private equity company, you expect that. It's high risk, but otherwise you just put your, com your money in mutual funds. You expect that kind of annual return. And private equity goes in with a cash influx at first, which is good if you're a more senior partner and you know, are thinking about retiring in the next few years. But it's really that second bite when the private equity sells to a bigger private equity 
where the second cash infusion comes in where you get that much of a return. Because in between that, you're basically discounting your salary um, because you're investing in the private equity, whether it's a management company or whatever it is. So it's a little bit tough and private equity does not come in to really improve healthcare as their primary goal. You know, they are um, very much in it for profit. A side effect can be better patient care, accumulation of big data, things like negotiating power. But I'm skeptical that this is going to really play out and maybe a repeat of the 1990s where, you know, we saw those kind of management companies come and then get really stressed in terms of assets down the road. That's different than hooking up with a company whose business is delivering care. Uh, and again, I go back to physician's endoscopy and capital digestive as, a, as an example. That's a long-term strategic play. They're not bound by a three to five year window. Um, so I think practices have to be very careful about who they're going to give their autonomy and, and particularly their financial autonomy to. Mm -hmm. So how does one balance uh, whether uh, at an individual level we agree or disagree uh, with private equity uh, but this is a wave uh, and it seems to be happening uh, regardless yep, definitely. of what uh, you, you know, a practice might uh, opine or feel, right? How do you make it better? If it is going to happen anyways, you know, how do you put uh, you know, checks and balances in place in such a way uh, that uh, it doesn't hurt patient care? I think there are ways. Uh, and first of all, it, as you know better than I, there are probably 200 private equity companies that are targeting medical practices, GI, things like that. And there are a lot of differences between those companies. If you have a company that's going in with a really financial bent that's just absolutely brutal, I would, I would be a little bit hesitant. But there are some really good private equity companies that are coming in and um, taking practices that have multiple EMRs, for example, and combining them into one, and then planning to use those big data to give real patient outcomes. Um, and you can almost accumulate enough patients to target a big payer and say, we will look at your patients and show that we can deliver better care. When you go in with that bent, <clears throat> whether it's private equity or a strategic partner, I think managing populations, uh, again, whether it's gastroenterology or cardiology or what, can improve care a lot. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of inefficiencies that we've, um, and those inefficiencies are going to be definitely stripped out. What kind of advice do you have uh, for an early stage uh, gastroenterologist who might be watching this? How should they plan uh, their career over the next five, 10 years? Well, I think there's a great opportunity. I think you have to be very careful about where you end up being employed, whether it's a health system or a practice. It goes back to the very basics. If the primary purpose of that practice or health system <clears throat> is to deliver good patient care, then that's going to come out in your interviews. It's going to come out in how the contracts are structured. It's going to come out in talking with the partners of the health system. You're going to be able to tell the difference between that and a practice or health system that is financially driven. Obviously, I would choose the former. I do think that the consolidation trend will definitely continue. I think that um, going into a small practice right now, except in some of those niche areas that I mentioned, is very, very difficult and challenging. But you want a practice that is well-run, that is patient-focused, and also is embracing the new technologies that we have. AI, remote patient monitoring, um, basically using technology to get rid of all of the routine stuff and strip out costs from what we do, whether it's colonoscopy preps delivered by bots or anything like that, you have to be thinking along those lines to really be successful. I do think you have to have a more consolidated large practice, whether it's multi-state or single state, depends on the region. You also have to have a capital partner and professional management that is really good and can anticipate changes. But I do see the practice of gastroenterology really consolidating like that. 
I think in the academic realm, it's going to be very tough. And academic centers that don't morph into a true integrated healthcare system are going to have a very tough time uh, competing with the integrated healthcare systems that are out there. And there's some really good ones. You cannot live on high tertiary quaternary care alone. You have to be able to deliver that secondary care and primary care. And then also, um, you know, offloading the most routine care. I think at the primary care level, a health system that can partner with some of the retail pharmacies or some of the now um, technology companies that are coming into you know, the lowest level routine care, I think you've got to partner with them. We're not going to be able to fight, you know, the Humanas, the CVSs, the Aetnas, the um, Optums in terms of routine primary care. So let's partner with them and use that as a win-win and really deliver the care that, that we need to. My uh, final question, uh, Dr. Allen, is uh, I, I want to go back to this whole COVID period, right? Like, so to a lot of people, uh, especially in healthcare, uh, it's also been a time uh, for reflection. Uh, and uh, people have reflected uh, on, on their own careers uh, at an individual level, but also uh, overall uh, at, at a larger uh, healthcare uh, industry or at, at a systemic level. Uh, now, if you go back to our healthcare system, whichever part of the world, uh, to a you know pre-COVID world, there's been increasing uh, patient and uh, physician uh, distrust, like uh, you know with each other. Uh, then there is this whole uh, business of healthcare aspect. Uh, the fact that there've been several articles about the evils of uh, corporatization of medicine and and so on. Uh, now, this reflective period of uh, this lockdown, COVID, and everything else surrounding it presents also an opportunity to reimagine a newer uh, healthcare system, you know, that's, that's uh, more uh, geared towards uh, doing good uh, and really good, being really a force for good uh, for patient care. So I want to ask you, uh, if you were to reflect on, on something like that, what would uh, a healthcare system look like uh, in, in your view? Well, the first thing is we have to acknowledge that this is not only COVID, but the um, racial and economic inequities in this country are, I think, simply intolerable, immoral, and unethical. Um, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, I was sitting about nine miles from um, that corner. And um, what happened in Minneapolis and now is spread across the country has demonstrated that we still have some really, really tough problems to solve. With COVID coming along, no matter what your politics, all you have to do is look at the statistics of who is most affected by this. And it is people that, um, have, that are suffering from health disparities. So the future in terms of healthcare or gastroenterology really has to reflect that. Um, we can't be in this for profit. We have to reestablish our credentials as physician who not only says do no harm, but feel a responsibility for the individual patient, for our community and for society at large. And I think that means moving towards a fund a infrastructure we have where we have healthcare for everybody. Um, however, that's delivered. <clears throat> remains to be seen, but for have to have uninsured Americans or to have Americans that simply cannot access health care at a fundamental level, uh, um, again, I just think is an immoral place for this country to be. And I think we have to step up with that and decide how we want to use our resources. Um, it gets into the whole wealth redistribution. It gets into the entire economy and tax situation. But at some point, we have to level the playing field. And, and I think we have a, an obligation to take care of people. So we go on from this, I think, really reflecting on what our individual and what our society responsibilities are is going to be very important. You know, we know, uh, being inside the system, that preventative care uh, will probably result in fewer procedures. But then the system gets compensated by more 
procedures because that's what we've built so far. Uh, and uh, we keep talking about you know value-based care, but you know the evolution of that is very very slow in what whatever we can see. So how how does one balance that? Because if if a hospital does not do uh, procedures, then it can't survive uh, at you know at an economic level. Uh, but if if it goes and invests in uh, say getting people in shape, for example, right? Like you know reversing their conditions. That's probably the right thing to do because then they don't end up, uh, you know, needing the procedures. Uh, but then if they end up doing, who pays for that? Uh, and uh, how, how does one balance in both these worlds? Well, you're right. <clears throat> We're paid a lot for the complications that we cause. I mean, that's basically what you're saying. And, and for illness, um, I do see a movement. So, for example, Alina Health just signed a six-year contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota uh, that switches to a value-based system with a uh, basically a two-sided risk, a 10% two-sided risk in terms of reimbursement, but coming with a partnership around reduction in um, pre-authorization and administrative cost and opening up of data systems. So, one thing, I, and Michigan is doing a similar uh, program, not quite that robust with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. So I think both the payers and health systems are realizing that we have to put real money on the table to um, partner and not be at odds with each other. So I see that movement actually happening faster and that will have some, some tremendous benefits. I think there's gonna to have to be an investment in health disparities uh, because that's where a lot of these costs come from. And that's going to have to come at either a state or federal level. We have to admit that there, there is a role for both the state and federal government in supporting those kind of health disparities. Um, you're, you're talking really hard economics. Uh, we can get into a discussion about wealth consolidation in this country and what it means. Um, but I th think this is a time of reflection. And a pandemic that hits like this um, really brings out how weak our safety net in this country was. And I, I think there are a lot of people that are interested in changing that. So we'll see what happens, but um, I mean, there is no way. I mean, I remember hearing Uvi Reinhardt many years ago saying, look, however it works, people that are earning more than $75,000 have to, have to shift some of their wealth to those that are earning less than $75,000 to provide health care." There's just no other way to do it. Um, there's some hard questions that we have simply kicked down the road that I don't think we can do that anymore. I know that's not a great answer to your question, but uh, it's uh, you know it's the best that I can do. I don't think I was even uh, looking for an answer because there is really no straight answer here. Just a reflection which I was seeking and uh, you know which you gave, and I really appreciate uh, that. Uh, Dr. Allen, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing all your perspective. It was uh, very, very insightful. And uh, yeah, thank you also for uh, being so candid uh, with everything. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, was there anything else that you wish to share uh, before you be close? No, I don't think so. I think um, these forums that you've put together are really interesting and keep doing them, basically. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you and to reflect on this and um, to really think about the future. Okay. Thank you.